at Akamatsu. Akamatsu now is six years old. When he was two years old, unfortunately, he was hit by a vehicle and paralyzed halfway down the back, um, which was bad news. We took him to the vet and the vet said he would maybe have three days to live, gave him some painkillers. But, you know, a week went by and he started to feel a little bit better. You know, he was definitely still paralyzed and would just slide around on the floor. But, you know, his appetite was coming back. He was breathing more easily. And now, four years later, he's still living a very vibrant, happy life. I'll try to take Akamatsu out um, once a day for a walk here in the park. I use this wheelchair, which is from a company in the United States called Eddie's Wheels. And I sent them uh, Akamatsu's measurements. And uh, they, they custom made this just for him. It's super simple. I take out the pin that's here. Pin. Open up that one piece of metal. I put his two legs through the little holes in the back. Close the bar. Insert the pin. He's good to go. There you go, buddy. Twice a day, I have to empty out his bladder. You can take your animal to a vet and they can show you where you have to put your hand and how much pressure you have to put on the bladder. And it took me like a few weeks before I actually figured it out. Anyway, once I did figure it out, good boy, um, it's very easy to do. Maybe it just takes a couple minutes each time I do it. And I try to do it two or three times a day. You need the right kind of pressure and you need to put it at the right position and then it, it's a bit delayed. So it takes maybe a few seconds before you see the reaction and you see urine actually coming out. One thing I discovered which is kind of cool is if I rub vigorously at the base of his spine and the beginning of his tail, that will uh, stimulate him to have a bowel movement. Wash my hands up with soap, wipe the seat with rubbing alcohol. Uh, yeah, if he happens to go poo at the very end, I'll just put like a little drop of bleach in the toilet after. We just found out recently that he's been diagnosed with cancer. About a week ago, he was actually almost uh, on, uh, he was almost at the end again. You know, the vets thought he might even have just two or three minutes to live. So, um, you know, he was having problems breathing and he was losing a lot of weight, but with a lot of uh, intense care over the last week, we brought him back from the brink and he has a chance of living between maybe three months and two years now with regular medication. Um, it's kind of a chemotherapy. You may be wondering why you see a few little patches of skin on him, and that's from the recent work that's been done for um, his cancer therapy. We're just waiting for that hair to grow back. We're gonna keep on helping him, you know. Um, I, I don't see any reason not to, other than the fact that it's, it's such a big bill to pay. Let's me talk to strangers and meet people. 
people I would never meet. <laughs> so it, that's true. My sister has a dog, and maybe he will lose his legs. Oh, yes. oh. but she wants to. When I'm faced with the choice of what to do with my cat, I listen to my feelings, and my feelings were pretty clear that I should try to help him as much as possible. And after he became paralyzed, uh, we became even closer, which is interesting because he started to become more reliant on me. So he wasn't the little baby cat that would jump around and chase after things all the time. Like he, he would have to look at me and communicate with me to tell me what he needed, you know, if he wanted the door open to the balcony so he could go out, he would look at me and then try to lead me over to the door. Or, you know, sometimes one thing that's really cute is if his ear is itchy, he'll come up to me and then like show me his ear, like kind of twitch it. And I mean, right away I'm like, oh, there's something wrong with his ear. I'll, and I scratch his ear and he, he's like, ah, thank you. Because he can't, you know, scratch anymore with his back legs always receptive to each other, always looking at each other, trying to communicate non-verbally, but even sometimes verbally now, you know, because I find there's such a range in the way that he'll make sounds, and you know, not every sound is a simple meow. Um, like if he's kind of upset about something, it will be a quick meow. Or, you know, if he wants a treat, it'll be more like a you know, so there's this, this vocabulary that he has, and I try to <laughs> talk back to him in the same vocabulary. So if I'm mad, I'll be like, Meh. It's just been very natural for me to want to help him, and I think as well, he, he helps me, you know, he, he helps me stay um, kind of tender and, and loving and caring, you know, and, and just, you know, he brings out that in me when I'm around him, so I, I'm very grateful for that. I mean, he's a good friend, I'm not, I'm not gonna be like, you know what, that's, sorry, that, that's too expensive. I would rather take a trip to Hawaii this winter. You know, I, no, I gotta help him, you know, I, as much as I can. And I feel good about that. Yeah, so that's why I'm doing it all. <laughs> he appreciates any time we get to go for a little bike ride. See you later. Akamatsu was always a source of strength for me and still is. You know, every morning he would fall out of bed and hit the floor with a bang because he couldn't land on his four feet. And he seemed to always refuse landing on the cushion I put there to soften his fall. He'd drag himself over to his food bowl and then drag himself over to the balcony to catch the first rays of sun, drag himself to the front door to greet me with excitement at the end of the day. That little guy was unstoppable. It was amazing, even two days before the end of his life, he was still purring softly when I pet him. 